Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers. You'll have realised that I'm coming from the perspective of Christian theology, trying to develop how, well, Christian theologians have seen the science and religion discourse, but I'm sure there is an awful lot of um, uh, concordance here with the way that Islam would also construe things. But I do hope to also present some challenges and to be a little bit provocative. So I, I kind of see myself as a bit of a warm-up act because I'm not really going to say anything much about AI or consciousness. I am a physicist originally, that's how I see my identity, although I've moved into theology almost imperceptibly. You might wonder how you can do that imperceptibly. Um, and I'm now representative of this scholarly field that we tend to call science and religion or religion and science. It is an academic field in its own right. It's not just a discourse to things clashing up against each other. Um, I was going to say a little bit about how this discourse might be relevant to the theme of the conversation, but thanks to two fantastic introductions, I can just dive straight in, really. Um, what I do want to say, though, is that whenever we try to talk about science and religion as a thing, or even two things, the question of relationship is always central. You, you just cannot get away from this issue of how do science and religion relate to each other. So, Every conversation about science and religion nearly always starts, even unconsciously, with some statement about your presuppositions and assumptions about what the relationship or relationships might be. So quite a lot of what I'm going to say will really be concerning that issue. We often don't even realize we're talking about relationship, but I'd like to sort of bring it out into the open, if you like. Um, and of course, we're all aware that in our modern secular society, there is a very um, implicit assumption about the relationship between science and religion, that of conflict, namely that science is winning a battle against religion, which is part of the, the, the kind of past ideology, if you like, destined slowly to be replaced by science and technology. And that's often referred to as the conflict hypothesis, and it's very often the starting point for any conversation about science and religion. Now, those of us who work in the science and religion field try strenuously to demonstrate that there is much more to the area than just conflict. Um, but, I mean, I do have to confess, own up really, that the whole existence of this field, the reason I get paid a salary by the University of Edinburgh, is because of the conflict hypothesis. It's why people are interested in the first place. So I can't disown it altogether. I have to be, you know, there's a certain element of me which is Jekyll and Hyde-ish about this, but it'll, I'll say more about it as we go along. I do want to say, though, that there are many problems with the conflict hypothesis and the whole kind of assumption of secularization, but um, those of us who want to kind of combat the conflict, you know, conflict the conflict hypothesis, if you like, often come up with a harmonizing hypothesis instead. That also has problems too, as I'll also try to, to suggest. Um, the long and the short of it is really that, is that neither of these sort of hypotheses that you might come up with is sufficient to count for, account for all of the complexities that you might discern in the relationship between science and religion. So what is the truth of the matter? How do they relate? Well, that's really the whole subject of my talk. So um, this shows a summary. I'm going to talk a little bit about this very nebulous, in ne nebulous in philosophical terms, term worldview, and ask the question of what is religion, what is science, and what is science and religion, before taking you through some of the possible solutions you might choose in trying to answer this, what is science and religion. Well, if you go into a, a popular level book on this area, and there are many, they very often start with a quotation from um, some great figure of the past. Um, let's start with Bertrand Russell, who was writing about this about a century ago. Here's a famous quote. Religion is something left over from the infancy of our intelligence. It will fade away as we adopt reason and science as our guidelines. And of course, you hear people today saying very similar things as well, such as Richard Dawkins. Now, of course, Russell was writing this nearly a century ago. It still hasn't come to pass. So, you know, religion is a bit, little bit more enduring than um, people of this particular viewpoint tend to suggest. And that's quite a good encapsulation of the, the conflict hypothesis. Let's try someone else who's 
often quoted in this context. Um, Albert Einstein, a very famous quote here, um, which those who want to put over a harmonizing position nearly always come up with this quote at some point. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Well, you know, very interesting positive quote to reflect on how science and re religion might be complementary to each other. And again, those who adopt a harmonizing perspective will often make some sort of complementarian movement, often in the, in the, in the way that Einstein did there. Um, here's another quote from a famous person which is often rolled out from Martin Luther King. Science investigates, religion interprets, science gives man knowledge which is power, religion gives man wisdom which is control. Again, a kind of complementarian perspective, although here we have a mention of power and control, so it's not just about knowledge, about, it's not, not, not just about what we know about the natural world, there are also social dynamics coming into play here as well. Uh, and I think that's quite a useful little um, quote to remind us that the science and religion discourse is not just epistemology, it's not just about what we know about the world, it actually matters in people's lives and how they go about living their lives. Um, I'll give you one last quote from an equally um, important and famous person, although not often used. I quite like this one. This is the famous astronomer Jocelyn Bell Burnell. I find that Quakerism, that's um, um, one particular strand of Christi Christianity, and research science fit together very, very well. In Quakerism, you're expected to develop your own understanding of God from your experience in the world. There isn't a creed. There isn't a dogma. So for her, she finds that her particular um, version of Christianity that she adheres to is extremely amenable to scientific faith because there isn't a creed attached to her faith in the, in the same way that, that men, perhaps other more traditional versions of Christianity might have. Um, so the suggestion there that perhaps there could be some conflict if you adopt another religious perspective. But for her, Quakerism at least is quite um, you know, a flexible way of, of combining science and religion. Well, I've just given you four quotes from great people there. Straight away, you've got um, quite a bit of uh, you know, breadth in terms of how you might construe the relationship. But I suggest to you that none of these actually contain the truth of the matter. Um, because we would all, I'm sure if I was to interview each one of you here, you would probably want to say more than what I've got up on the screen here. So what I want to introduce now is this term that I said is rather philosophically nebulous, but actually very helpful, or at least I find it so, worldview. What is this? Well, if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, you get a very succinct definition, which is probably for the best, because if you try and tease it out further, you'll get, um, get into, tangled into knots, I suspect. Um, a particular philosophy of life or conception of the world. Okay, so really very succinct, but so vague as to not be terribly helpful because you could say that both science and religion count as worldviews in this definition, and in fact it's common with, for those who adhere to the conflict hypothesis to talk about science and religion as two conflicting worldviews or two clashing worldviews. I'm not convinced by that way of looking at things, to be honest, because I know plenty of people, including myself, who are religious and who also work in the sciences. Does that mean I've got two worldviews? Well, that just makes nonsense to the ter term. How can I possibly have two worldviews going on? Surely I only have one. So um, what I suggest to you is that actually um, the conflict hypothesis itself is a worldview just as the harmonizing hypothesis is a worldview, another worldview. And I will slowly develop that way of looking at things, which I personally find more helpful than talking about hypotheses like conflict or harmony or whatever. The problem is, I suggest, is that um, much of this discourse between science and religion has tended to assume that these are two essential substances, almost like icebergs in the ocean crashing up against each other. But once you start to look into the, the details of how you relate them, this kind of essentialist approach starts to fall apart. And much of what I'll do is to try to sort of unpick that essentialist assumption that, that dominates so much of the thinking about science and religion as we go along. Well, first of all, um, I said that I would 
ask the question of what is religion? Well, our term religion, or at least the way we tend to use it today, really only goes back to around the 19th century, where you might have one religion as distinct from another. And coincidentally, perhaps not, it also arose at the same time that science and the sciences were starting to become um, distinct as uh, modes of inquiry and disciplines. It is no accident that the terms science, religion, and science and religion all arose about the same time in the 19th century and clearly came to prominence around the Darwin debates. In other words, these terms are not um, independent of each other, historically. Well, religion is notoriously difficult to define in general terms, um, although, of course, we all know what it is. This is one of the uh, paradoxes of the term. So um, let me give you a very famous definition from Clifford Goertz in 1966, an anthropologist who wrote that, um, of course, this is his attempt to try to make a general purpose definition which also includes religions which are not theistic. Okay. So a religion is, one, a system of symbols which acts to, two, establish powerful, pervasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations in men and women as well, by, three, formulating conceptions of a general order of existence, and, four, clothing these conceptions with such an aura of facticity that, five, the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. Okay, so that's a very famous definition, um, really majoring on the role of symbols. Now, notice that this actually works for many of the natural sciences as well. So it's not watertight in terms of describing what religion is. Um, it's a rather abstract definition, big emphasis on the cognitive role of symbols, but nothing on ritual or ethical or social obligations, except perhaps this rather mysterious term, um, motivations, whatever that means. So um, those of us who actually practice a religion might also want to emphasize terms like encounter, for instance, with a deity and with each other as fellow believers. Um, we might also want to introduce issues about uh, the way that our religion attempts to deal with the hard facts of life, for instance, like suffering and evil and death, in addition to all of this. Um, so what, what you find is that um, a definition like this, which of course has tried very hard to be general, is actually so general that it doesn't really capture anyone's religion. So big problem with this kind of attempt to um, introduce a definition of religion. Um, and we have something similar when we try to explain, well, what is science? Well, um, it's also rather difficult to define in essentialist terms, like just as religion was. So, is it a methodology? We often talk about the scientific method. Or is it a set of topics? So, I've just thrown up on the screen um, a whole series of possible sciences here, all of which have their own very well-defined domains and... Uh, you know, ways of going about their, their business, but I mean that effectively means there are as many methodologies as there are sciences. They're all connected by the fact that they're committed to observation, testing, and um, constructing and revising hypotheses. Of course, that is definitely a core part of the scientific method, whatever the scientific method is. But so are many other disciplines commit, commit, committed to that as well, such as history, for instance, and even theology to some degree. So um, what you find is that when you try to pin down the scientific method, um, it's insufficiently precise or, or a little bit too nebulous to really also pin down what the natural sciences are at the same time. It's, very, it's easy if you're a German speaker because you can just use the term Wissenschaft for all kinds of rigorous disciplines, including philosophy and history and so on. But in English, we have this real problem that we use science really to mean the natural sciences. Well, um, let me take my particular science here, just to show you an example. So, physics. Here you have two beautiful pictures from um, two physics experiments uh, in recent years. What concern, what connects research into galaxy clusters on the left from the Hubble Space Telescope with this shot, a screenshot effectively, from the Large Hadron Collider at CERN on the right-hand side. Now I've put length scales on the top, so 
10 to the 16 meters on the left, 10 to the minus 15 on the right. That's 31 orders of magnitude between the two. But if I hadn't put those on and I hadn't told you what they were, you might be confused or might you know, think, well, is, it, is he actually looking at the same length scale here? The universe has a, well, an amazing fact about the universe is this degree of self-similarity at the two extremes of length scale. Now, what's amazing, though, is that we don't really know how to connect those two theoretically, except for the hunch that it's all something to do with the first earliest moments of the Big Bang, when quantum mechanics and gravity were somehow part of the same physical system. But theoretically, we can't really get very far at combining them. So, but, you know, so, so really, in, in saying that this is all of the same physics, that's a hunch, really. We can't, can't combine them fully theoretically. And what about uh, this next set of pictures I'm going to show you here? Um, you've got the Large Hadron Collider at the top left and, and seen from the air up beneath it near Geneva. Um, and on the right-hand side, you've got a wonderful T-Rex, everyone's famous dinosaur, and some paleontologists going about their work there. What connects these two kinds of science? What are the questions they ask? Are they in any way related? If they talk about laws of nature in their own disciplines, are they related? Can they compare and contrast and combine them? This is a very difficult open question about what does it mean to talk about science if we can't even necessarily talk about a law of, laws of Tyrannosaurus rex compared with laws of Higgs bosons. Well, I didn't choose these two um, subjects by accident. Of course, particle physics uh, is highly mathematical, extremely successful at demonstrating our ability to, to discern symmetry and order and structure in the universe. So often used as an example of why religion doesn't work very well, because look, we're doing so well with our physics. And um, paleontology is, of course, at the heart of the evolutionary um, view, or scientific view of the world, o also often used to challenge religious viewpoints. So both of these, in their own ways, effectively, are sciences that have been used to challenge uh, uh, religious viewpoints. Well, despite the difficulty of trying to connect these into one coherent, unified scientific picture of the world, many of those who work in the science and religion field, the, the field that I represent, think that we do have a way of, of combining them and unifying them, and it goes like this. This is the answer. Quite literally, nothing can connects them. Or rather, actually, this is a bit of a theological joke. Um, it's the idea of creation from nothing. Um, this idea that when God created the world, uh, God is not a thing like any thing in the world. So therefore, the world was created from no thing, creation from nothing. Um, of course, this is a very familiar idea in Jewish and Islam theology to some degree as well, connected with the um, first cause argument, Kalam, and so on. So um, very, very important um, theological argument. But if, if you are a monotheist and you adhere to this way of thinking, then it's a beautiful way of connecting all of the sciences together because you say that they all come from this first cause, from this no thing who created the world. Um, God is the, effectively the, the bigger box that sits around the sciences and provides meaning, purpose, and unification to them all. So, of course, clearly I'm adopting a theological um, unification there. The sciences can't easily do it of themselves. I'm putting the sciences into a bigger metaphysical box. Well, that does mean, though, of course, that if you want to talk about, oh, uh, yes, just another note about what I was saying there. If you want to talk about science and religion as two separate things, you can see that I'm actually, in placing a, a bigger box around the sciences, I'm really trying to create one worldview. Perhaps I'd be better off talking about religious science or scientific religion rather than science and religion. This is um, me trying to demonstrate how, you know, most attempts to overcome the questions about what is religion, what is science, start moving you towards attempts to, to unify and to find a worldview that works where both religion and science can be combined or, or con uh, compared with each other meaningfully. But I am getting ahead of myself because I want to go through some of the, the famous essentialist approaches to this question of what is science and religion. So I'll say a little bit about this man here, Ian Barber, 
who is often said to be the founder of science and religion as, a, uh, as an academic discipline. And one of the things he is best known for is, uh, are his four models of interaction. So he felt that the, all of the science and religion discourse or debate could be um, captured by means of these four models, conflict, independence, dialogue and integration. And I'll go through those one by one. I won't spend too long on them. But the way he describes them, they are effectively evolutionary. So the starting point is you assume conflict. And as you work through the issues, effectively you go down the list and, become, and uh, science and religion become ever closer together. OK, so let's start with conflict. Now, historically, this idea of conflict, that um, science and religion are ever at odds with each other, science is continuously replacing religion as a, as a means of knowing about the world. Um, this goes back really to the 19th century, and in particular, two writers, Andrew Dixon White and John William Draper, who wrote these um, books uh, with you know, very aggressive, if you like, titles, A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom, and History of the Conflict between Religion and Science. Now, Actually, these two people are very famous for having um, invented the conflict hypothesis. It actually predated them to some degree. But um, they often assume, or, or for, for religious people often demonize these two as though they were um, kind of trying to destroy religion. Actually, if you read their books, they're very kindly disposed to religious thought, but they are just, um, they, they, they tend to be attacking particular forms of traditional religious thought. So they're actually rather friendly towards what you might call liberal theology. And, uh, and White, in particular, was a big friend of biblical scholarship. So they're by no means uh, out, and out to destroy religion altogether. Anyway, just to give you a quote from Draper's book, this is the opening, uh, these, this, these famous lines about the conflict hypothesis. The antagonism we thus witness between religion and science is the continuation of a struggle that commenced when Christianity began to attain political power. The history of science is not a mere record of isolated discoveries. It's a narrative of the conflict of two contending powers, the expansive force of the human intellect on one side and the compression arising from traditionary faith and human interests on the other. So very heavily loaded language against religion. But Seemingly in general, but as I said, if you go through his book, you'll see he has a much more nuanced position. Well, today we find this kind of attitude played out in both religious and non-religious circles. Um, I, there are many examples I could have chosen. It often involves a rather aggressive attitude from one direction or the other. So particular, for instance, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris have often uh, put this kind of aggression into words. Here's a, a good quote from Jerry Coyne's recent book. The claim that religion and science are complementary ways of knowing gives unwarranted credibility to faith, a credibility that, at its extremes, is responsible for many human deaths and might ultimately contribute to the demise of our own species and much other life on Earth. Really amazing statement there. Um, of course, I assume he's talking here. He doesn't, go, he doesn't really go into it in much more depth in his book. I assume he's talking about climate change in particular and the way especially in North America, it's tied to a religious agenda. So, but I mean, you know, he's making the point that this is not just a mere academic exercise, how science and religion relate to each other. It really does matter. Well, he comes from the atheist end of the spectrum, but also um, religious people have often um, articulated the conflict hypothesis. Here's a good example of a, um, someone coming from fundamentalist Christianity saying something very similar. This is Henry Morris. We've been living in an age of deep skepticism. A century of evolutionary philosophy with its seeds of naturalism and atheism has yielded the bitter fruits of violence, non-moralism, and despair. So again, he is preaching this message of conflict between science and religion. This stuff really matters, he thinks, to ordinary people. It's not just an academic exercise. Now, let's go on to the next model that Barber suggested. This is called independence, the idea that science and religion can get along by 
just being independent of each other. They don't need to bother each other. Um, the most famous example of this model comes from the, um, the paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould, and is often referred to as NOMA, non-overlapping magisteria. This is the idea that science and religion, each of them is a magisterium, you know, a system of, of, of authority in intellectual terms in its own right, but they don't need to bother each other because they don't overlap. Well, um, many, um, certainly I, I can speak for Christians, many Christians adopt a, uh, a viewpoint rather like this because you'll often hear people saying things like, there's no conflict between science and religion, almost they don't overlap. But we often want to talk about consonance or complementarity um, or the fact that they might be concordant. In other words, trying to go beyond the sense of independence to a degree of um, agreement in some sense. So one of the difficulties of the independence model is that you nearly always want to put a little bit more content into it to say, well, how might they? Okay, so look, right, I think they are independent. They don't really bother each other too much, but surely there must be some point of contact here. So you nearly always want to go towards some complementarian model. Um, and another way of say, saying this, which you often hear people um, express, is um, science asks the how questions, religion asks the why questions. Another, another sort of very famous way or popular way of, of being a complementarian, if you like, trying to create peace. Um, dialogue is the third model that Barber came up with, and this was actually his fam favorite one himself, where he felt that science and religion can actually learn from each other if they bother to speak to each other. In a conference like this is a great example of, of dialogue. Um, and you can go back to the history of science to show how dialogue has worked for hundreds of years until relatively recently. So, for instance, you could point out that uh, Christian theology in the Middle Ages was known as the queen of the sciences. Sciences in the term of Wissenschaft, not natural sciences. Um, the doctrine of creation is often said to have been um, a theological idea which gave the sciences free reign in effect or, or the, 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 the kind of the ideological impetus to start the kinds of investigation that blossomed into the scientific revolution. And um, if the sciences can't ask, answer the questions about why is there order in the world, why does mathematics work, why should there be laws, we can look back further to the underlying theology and metaphysics to say, well, this is rooted in the very being of God. God made the world according to uh, the monothe monotheistic religions. God made the world to be good, to reflect God's own being. So there are ways of, of, uh, in history of seeing the way that dialogue has worked between scientific and religious, religious viewpoints. Can they work today? Well, um, Peter Harrison, the well-known historian of science and religion, makes the point that even to speak of laws of nature and regularity and the uniformity <coughs> of nature is to make a tacit assumption about the nature of the universe, um, a tacit theistic assumption. So he makes the point that even to talk about uniformity and laws of nature is really to do theology, whether you realize it or not. <coughs> is dialogue possible again on this basis? That's a an important question that might be worth asking at some point. Um, but I'm going to go on to the fourth model of Barber's uh, system, integration. And this is where science and religion ultimately ask the same questions. Now, this is probably the least successful of all of the attempts to um, deal with the science and religion question, because not many people have found ways of totally integrating um, scientific and religious perspectives. A famous one that did work very well um, is uh, Pierre Théard de Chardin, the, the Jesuit theologian and paleontologist who uh, came up with the idea that the risen Christ is the epitome of evolution. All of um, the kind of evolutionary sweep is moving towards the risen Christ who he called the omega point. So that, that's an example of, of someone who tried to put forward a, an integrationist viewpoint. But like I said, there haven't been very many of them. Now, those are Barber's four models. That's by no means the end of the story. I'll show you a couple of other approaches. This one is very well known. It tends to be referred to as complexity, um, although the person who's responsible for it doesn't like this name very much. He never uses it himself. John Hedley Brook, um, another of the well-known uh, historians of science and religion, 
In his famous book, Science and Religion, Some Historical Perspectives, um, this is a wonder, I mean, it's, the, it's such a downplayed title, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I really recommend it very strongly if you're interested in the history of, of how the debate got going. Um, this book largely takes the, the, the viewpoint that the, the famous conflict hypothesis that science and religion are at war is a, a misconstrual of the historical um, evidence. And once we start looking at it in detail, we can see how um, actually there are so many degrees of complexity going on at every single historical episode we might want to, to examine. Even individual thinkers can have, like Darwin for instance, could um, have had, had, had different viewpoints about science and religion at different times in his life. So if that's true of one thinker, how can we say that the, all of science and religion is, uh, is characterized by conflict, for instance? And so what he says, um, the fundamental weakness of the conflict hypothesis is its tendency to portray science and religion as hypostasized forces, as entities in themselves. They should be, rather be seen as complex social activities involving different expressions of human concern the same individuals often participating in both. So um, a great example of someone attacking the conflict hypothesis, but notice that he goes further and he makes the point that if on the back of this you want to say, ah, oh, so clearly the conflict hypothesis is deeply misguided, so I'm going to put my own harmony hypothesis in instead. He says, don't make that mistake because it's vulnerable to exactly the same criticism. One last example, which I tend to refer to as prophetic conflict, and this comes from a recent thinker, Willem Drace, in his book Religion and Science in Context. He makes the point that science and religion, as an academic subject, is a product of secularization. It wouldn't, we wouldn't be asking these questions if we didn't have a secular um, context around us. And in fact, he makes the point that um, if religion is doing its job properly, there ought to be conflict with science because it provides a prophetic conscience to science. So rather than trying to smooth everything over, actually religion is doing its job if it's prophesying to science and pointing out the importance of values over just pure kind of progress. But I need to come to an end now because I see my time is coming up. So this is my summary slide. Well, you can see I've gone through um, six models, and I'd like to add my own, which often doesn't get mentioned, of simple incomprehension between science and religion. What is the truth of the matter? I've provided you seven models. Which do I prefer? Well, I'm, I can move backwards and forwards on these, to be honest, and I suspect that all of us can, depending on which particular scientific issues we're thinking about and which religious issues. And this is why... I suggest that worldview is a much better term for construing what's going on here than models. Conflict is one worldview. If you assume that science and religion are in conflict, that is one worldview. Independence is another. Dialogue, another. In other words, what I suggest is that we think in terms of the, the complex social, contextual, and religious factors that have brought us to where we adopt, at the point of where we adopt our models. Think of those in terms of worldviews rather than these essentialist models. So um, having done a little bit of setting the scene, I'll stop there and hope that you'll all take this over it th but through talking specifically about consciousness and AI. So thank you for listening. Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.